Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about galleries and museums at historically Black colleges and universities and the important work they do with special guests. Dr. Liz Andrews, director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Arts. Dr. Jontal Robinson, curator of the Legacy Museum at Tuskegee University and founding director of the Alliance of HBCU Museums and Galleries. And Jamal Sheets, director and curator of the Fisk University Art Gallery. So thank you all for joining us. This is just terrific. I am so looking forward to our discussion and to becoming a more educated person uh, through the grace of, of, of your sharing of, of your experiences. I'm just going to uh, going to uh, set this up, and we're going to go over to uh, to Liz Andrews in Atlanta. Um, in these days, uh, when people are trying to teach art, culture, and history, and also when people are trying to outlaw the teaching of uncomfortable art, uncomfortable culture, and uncomfortable history. Historically, Black colleges and universities exist to illuminate truth and train leaders. Uh, so let's begin by describing the ideals that guide your work. And, and we will go to you, Dr. Andrew, Andrews. Um, the first HBCU, HBCUs were founded at the uh, end of the 1830s, 1837 to be exact. Fisk uh, uh, originated one year after the Civil War in 1966. Spelman and Tuskegee in 1881. So Dr. Andrews, what makes HBCU museums unique um, and distinctive within the museum field? And, and what, are, what are their similarities with other museums in the museum field, particularly in university museums? Thank you for the question, Mark. And um, I'm so um, honored, I wanna just say first, to be here with Dr. Robinson and Mr. Sheets, and I've admired your work for many years, so it's really beautiful to be joining you in this conversation. As far as the work of HBCUs, in particular HBCU museums, I think that they're similar to, for instance, a, an encyclopedic museum like the High Museum of Art, or the Met or Los Angeles County Museum, in that they are providing a full history. They are showing art of all mediums across time. And so in many ways, it is a particular beautiful slice of history. It's just a specific lens into the history of art. And HBCUs have always served as such an incredible place for culture, for art, for music. And so what I think we are seeing today is even more of a desire for HBCUs to step up and be exhibiting the artists that have been overlooked and really showing the forecast of what is to come. And I think that happens through exhibitions uh, and also through collections, which is something that's a big priority for myself at Spelman right now. One of the things that really strikes me is this ability to turn adversity into opportunity, where you take overlooked artists, uh, an overlooked perspective or a series of perspectives, uh, overlooked resources, and all of a sudden you find that the culture is actually driven by what is overlooked, right? And uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, the legacy of Tuskegee University um, and, and the museum that you have and also the coalition that you've built is so interesting. And you and I've uh, shared, you, you were generous enough to share one of your articles with me. I'd, li I'd love to get to that. But uh, could you give us, us your take on what makes these museums so important to the entire field, a field that needs to be informed by uh, a perspective that uh, sometimes has not been given voice? Well, what I to answer that question, I will go back to Booker T. Washington, who was the first president of Tuskegee. And when he was fundraising, he was seeking monies from wealthy uh, entrepreneurs in the North. Booker T. Washington created the most elegant, sumptuous book called Daily Resolves. Um, gold with gold leaf in it. 
So I'm going to use Booker T. Washington as my point of departure. He understood the importance of art, the necessity of it. And this is what he used to fundraise. I think I think uh, Dr. Robinson was frozen. One of the one of the uh, the great uh, aphorisms that uh, that Washington um, gave to us. Oh, there you are, uh, Dr. Robinson. You froze for a bit. Okay. So Booker T. Washington. Uh, uh, I don't know if you heard my explanation about his daily resolves, yes. uh, the book that he used for fundraising, but Tuskegee always had a, a museum and a library uh, in its history. The thing is, as we have come through the decades, some of our, some of our interests have changed. And I think STEM gets a lot of um, STEM gets a lot of coverage, and the arts not so much um, at Tuskegee. So what happens is we have to remind people of the significance of the visual arts and the art industries in America. Um, we have to we have to keep our desires in the forefront so that they will not be overlooked or 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 forgotten. And I think that the Legacy Museum has done a credible job in trying to remind people of the necessity of the visual arts in everyday life. And the alliance that um, arose from a UNCF Mellon Teaching and Learning Institute that Dr. Carol McFarlane and I came together to create, that alliance is additional force about the importance of the visual arts at HBCUs and how we could together systematically disrupt and inter intervent the marginalization. You know, you're making a very interesting point. Um, uh, Booker Washington's uh, aphorisms and, and they, his, his uh, ability to communicate, his ability to use words to galvanize action and to analyze uh, circumstance uh, it's a form of communication that can overshadow the visual arts, which is really about form, uh, about a, a different way of, of bringing a, me a message. So to recover that, even taking the uh, traditions that came out of uh, Booker Washington's uh, founding and leadership of the institution requires uh, different perspectives that come into a different prioritization that comes into uh, 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 university over time. Um, Jamal Sheets, uh, when you look at Fisk University galleries, how do you program the Fisk University gallery in order to, um, to communicate mm -hmm. in ways that words are inadequate um, to, to do so that you're, you're basically engaging artists and their sensibilities in the way they communicate um, so that uh, we all can have a richer experience of the messages that, that these leaders have to bring to us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start by answering that question. I'm going to uh, piggyback on what Dr. Robertson was talking about in terms of Booker T. Washington. And I'm going to use Booker T. Washington as an example of not just the orator, but actually the image that remains. And I'll add, beg that I would beg to ask the question: Have you ever seen an image of Booker T. Washington with anything out of place? No, no. And so he understood what that image had the capacity to do. And so with that, thinking about Fisk and our history, the other thing I'd like to say is that the cult, the 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 visual and performing arts have been a part of the cultural fabric of the institution since its founding. I mean, we've been a collecting institution since the 1870s. And the other thing I'd like to say is that it's Charles S. Johnson who called the arts the soft armor of a nation, that it could change the hearts and mind of a people. 
And so it's through those two lenses of understanding what images have the capacity to do uh, in changing the hearts and minds of a people, or even reclaiming one's past as a way that in which we display our work and also develop programming. Now, the thing that we focus on more broadly is centered around access um, in a lot of ways. And so we try to make our collections as accessible as possible. I talk to our students a lot about this is a safe place for you to explore. It's a safe place for you to think critically about the world. But then on the other side, we also have an obligation to respond to the, the moments that are happening now. And so to answer your question, how do we do the programming? I can give you two examples really quickly. Um, I will say one was in 2017 after the, the murder of Brown. I had a student that came in, said that he had PTSD. Uh, it was 2016. Uh, said that he had PTSD. He didn't feel safe walking from one neighborhood to the next neighborhood, going to work and going back to school. At that same time, in a different bucket, uh, an artist by the name of Jonathan Calm was investigating uh, Green Books and then also 25 Years of Police Brutality. So in essence, how we were able to bring together a conversation about how that student was feeling, that we ended up doing an exhibition two years later, Automobility, African-American, the Hazardous Freedoms of the Open Road, which looked at the legacy of the Green Books and then 25 years of police brutality. So you're, you're bringing together uh, history, Absolutely. you're bringing together the visual arts, you're bringing together mental health concerns, mm -hmm. right? This, th this idea of, of being vulnerable to attack, Yep. Right. And you're you're actually creating an experience that is so much more rich and textured that allows us to all of us to process those fears that we might each feel for ourselves, but now start appreciating in others as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you come to the uh, decision to reach to 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 go into that particular, because each investment is an investment, right? Each, it's an investment of time, it's an investment of resources. How do you reach that, that decision? And it'd be great to have um, uh, Liz, Dr. Andrews, if you could also talk about how you come to decisions as to what you present in the museum and then, and then uh, Dr. Robinson. But Jamal, starting with that particular example that you provided, there were a lot of, I'm sure, different options that you had. That was the thing that you decided to go with. What, what prompted you to make that particular decision? Mm. Because it was this, the, just that at that time, that was the most poignant uh, pressure point on the campus that we needed to have a conversation. Now, every decision doesn't function that way. I mean, generally, we plan exhibitions two to three years out. Right. Um, and so we can't, we, we have to be agile enough to make those decisions at those times, but also uh, in our collections themselves. And we do a lot of shows that are, that are based on our collection. Um, and again, it's about understanding uh, and reclaiming our own identity. Um, for our students on campus, we, we have a rather robust gallery ambassador program. And so we spend a lot of time listening and this helps inform those decisions. Uh, listening to our students, but also we seek to integrate the galleries in all academic disciplines. So I spend a lot of time talking with faculty as well. So you're not in an ivory tower. You're, oh, no, you're, oh, you're not at all. I mean, we, we, no, no, not at all. I mean, we're not just, and that, and that goes back to the operative word again is access, you know, and then also thinking about where the students are coming from. When I talk to my students and they're thinking about going to a museum, it's already a white cube. It's already a barrier. So I have to work twice as hard to begin to deconstruct that. Um, and so with that, uh, you've to, to get to, to get this to get engagement, we have to be a participant. We have to be a collaborator. We have to listen to our students and our faculty. So that's kind of a, the basis, but it's a that's a complicated question with limited amount of time that that I don't know if I could go into uh, to discuss how all of those decisions are made, but that kind of forms the basis of that. Outside of looking at, um, in certain exhibitions, I'm always looking at who, who's made significant contributions that has not been recognized. Uh, Liz, we, we just finished a poll um, uh, in which we asked um, how many people have actually visited uh, a HBCU um, museum, and it wasn't that many. 
Um, it basically um, half the people, and this is select audience, mind you. So the, the odds are much higher. Um, could you just continue to, to comment on, on uh, this idea of how you program and, and how you create a programming mix that is pre-planned, but also uh, responsive to the needs of, the, of today? Sure. Well, first, I have to recognize that I am definitely the rookie on this call because we are actually mounting the first show that the museum has had in almost two years since COVID right now. And so we'll be opening back up to Spelman, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta, the AUC community next month, which I'm very excited about. And what is the show? It's a permanent collection show, and it's celebrating 25 years of the museum's existence. So Spellman has been around for longer, of course, and has been collecting for a long time. But uh, the museum itself is celebrating its 25th. So we're looking at the collection and the mission. So, of course, we are a museum dedicated to uplifting the voices and the art of women of the African diaspora, Black women. But the, the collection is much larger. And so I think that people will be surprised, people who have both been to an HBC museum before and not, to see these incredible works of art. We have a gorgeous beard in, a couple Hale Woodruff pieces, and then everything to, you know, um, Benny Andrews. So it's it's a wider collection. As far as how we're thinking about moving forward with programs, with exhibitions, I really want to have um, a balance of bringing in exhibitions from the outside that have been organized by other institutions. So in this upcoming year, we'll have a solo exhibition by Lava Thomas, an artist who took images of the mugshots of women from the Montgomery bus boycott and made artworks out of these. So they're not only incredible works of art, but there's so many points of entry. You know, you have the idea of access, of women making noise, of transportation that you can bring into the conversation. Well, and criminalizing speech. Exactly. You know, making somebody because they are demanding uh, treatment and respect, making right. that a criminal act. Yeah. And, and also, I think it's important to be showing artists who are on the rise. You know, um, I, I had someone tell me when I first came on at Spelman that they always knew who was going to be the hottest artist three years from now, because when they came to Spelman, they'd see that artist. So it's, it's, uh, has a legacy of being on the cutting edge. And then in the spring of next year, we're going to be bringing Black American Portraits, which is an exhibition I curated, co-curated as a companion to the Obama Portraits at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So when Jamal was talking about Booker T. Washington, you know, dressed to the nines, looking pristine in every image, we really wanted to bring out the legacy of how important portraiture is. Portraiture is a tool of power that people have used for generations. You know, you think about Frederick Douglass, you think about Martin Luther King, they, there is such an importance placed on presenting a beautiful, upright image to the world. And so well, it, it links into Dr. Robinson's point. And uh, Dr. Robinson, we just uh, saw a fantastic exhibition uh, by a photographer. Um, uh, it, I, I can't recall what, it, what the title of the exhibition was, but it was a series of portraits, uh, Dr. Andrews, of African-American men in, uh, with, with uh, just their face, right? All in, all in black, so you could just see their face. And then there's a series of other portraits, and this, this was in the Flint Institute of Arts. Fantastic exhibition of them in their daily clothing, doctors, attorneys, um, uh, people working in retail, people who are homeless, people who are artists, just, you know, people, basically. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal idea of what do you see? And then what do you see? Right? 
Uh, Dr. Robinson, how do you, you, you're the person who can instruct us all. How do you think about exhibitions and what a museum, what an, what an HBCU museum um, ought to present? And, and what are you presenting over in Tuskegee? Well, I wanted to uh, go back to something that uh, Dr. Andrews said. I really like that slice of life that she talked about in her opening uh, commentary. So I want I want to tell you what we're doing and why it is a necess, uh, why it is necessary for us to do this. So we are mounting we are in the midst of mounting two installations while I am talking to you. Um, we have John Wilson's studies um, reckoning with the incident. It's a, a, a series of studies that he did for a mural uh, on lynching a lynching incident. And then, uh, and that was organized by Yale University and they were kind enough to allow us to have this exhibition. And we are so grateful to, to uh, the Yale University uh, Gallery of Art. And then I thought that it would be a nice companion to that uh, exhibition for us to do historical and contemporary voices from Tuskegee on lynching, police brutality, and white supremacy. And the reason, now, that, that those are some heavy topics. But the reason that I thought and this was necessary, and a curator has such a wonderful advantage. I mean, we can... I mean, we can drive a situation. We can make decisions about how things can go or must go in order to educate our constituencies and our audiences. So I decided in the midst of a pandemic, we really did need to look at anxiety, fear, trepidation, dread. And in looking at them and confronting them, we are able to lift ourselves up. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at police brutality. We're going to look at uh, white supremacy. We're going to look at lynching. And so I've got all of these contemporary voices. I ask everybody on the campus, won't you say something to me about what you feel about, and, and, and I mean, I ask groundskeepers, I ask, uh, the people who who clean the restrooms. I ask everybody, what do you think about these topics? And isn't that what art is? Art is for us all. Art is not just for people who have a particular professional um, uh, profession or a particular education. Art is for us all. One of the things that really strikes me is how topical and interactive you all are thinking about your audience as opposed to just looking at this from the point of view of a museum institution or a collection. It seems like you're all talking about dialogue, dialogue with your audience and being affected by your audience. Uh, Dr. Robinson, when you say I'm going and asking people, you're not telling people, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Your vocabulary, you're asking, you're engaging in dialogue. Is, is part of what you all are trying to do is to elicit interactions? Uh, Jamal, you, you mentioned that, you know, you have a barrier sometimes of people coming in. To, so part of it is you're trying to draw people in, right? You're trying to create this attractive force so that people will wander into the museum and actually have that experience, no? Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I mean, I, I, I'm smiling because every time I... I I'm in a room with, with Dr. Robinson. I'm excited to get back to work uh, and feel <laughs> motivated. And so she is she she uh, I owe her a great debt of of, of inspiration. Uh, and and is and she's such a wonderful uh, champion. And so she gets me pumped up. But you know, uh, yeah, I mean, art is a communal experience. It is not something to be viewed in a silo or 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 in your lonesome. I mean, it can be, but I definitely think it's about an exchange. Um, and that the, our collections house such a repository of knowledge and information. And so it takes uh, people coming into the doors in that exchange, that communal aspect, 
uh, to activate it. And so I think that's a, a, a key part of it. We just completed a poll of very interesting results and quite unexpected. Um, we asked uh, what three factors were most important in, in, and achievable in helping a university museum to forge a distinctive identity. And now th these are being answered in the context of this particular discussion. And here's the thing that's surprising. It's very even. And let me just read some of these uh, ideas to you. And then, um, uh, Dr. Andrews, if you could comment. Acquiring works of merit for the museum's uh, permanent collection. Commissioning new works by contemporary artists. Uh, developing first-class technical capabilities to research art. Interesting ex uh, exhibitions of, of works and artists of merit. Linking the academic research resources of the university to the work of the museum. Outreach to audiences providing distinctive public and educational programs. I actually thought that there might be an imbalance here, but restricting people to three answers, we still got pretty much all of the above. Uh, and do you see that that's part of, of your role, that you're not just an art museum in a fine arts museum sense, but you're also a forger of dialogue, a community healer, a processor of trauma, a honoring of the past, a developer of new talent. You're, you're all of these, are you not? We, we all are, we all are part, a part of this. And I wanted to compliment Jamal. Um, Jamal has uh, a program at his museum <clears throat> that I just love. And to me, it is what we should be doing to uh, militate against what has happened to us in terms of cons conservation and the lack of uh, African American, Native American, and Latinx conservators. Jamal has babies in the museum. And babies in the museum, to me, you've got to hit this thing as early as you can. If you want to do something about cur cur cultural heritage preservation, get the babies in the museum. And I love, okay, I love this. I, I, I've got to go to the source. Jamal, babies in the museum. Okay, yes, we on. do. We, we, we call it big. We call it big. And so it's uh, babies in the gallery. Um, and that's a fantastic, and, 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 and that's true. I mean, we feel that we serve a population uh, eight weeks old to 800 or eight, you know. And so we have programs that, that span that uh, in a normal academic year. And Dr. Robinson's right. Um, when we look at, and I don't know where to answer the question or to answer the question, uh, but when we look at when people, when, I mean, when we look at when people begin to formulate opinions or ideas about what professions they hope to choose, it starts early on. And so we try to address that uh, by having contact hours, uh, not, you know, working with, with mothers and babies. Uh, we also have another program called Experiment Fridays. That's for three to five year olds. And then one of my students developed another program, which is called Lego Builds. That's from 11 to 13 year olds. That would generally have, that program is on hold because of COVID but that would happen once a month. And then all the other programs that we have for, for adults. But to go back to your question about uh, the key areas that the poll revealed were equal. Yes, we all do those things and we all have to. Um, we're all part of a community. Uh, I think about our students. I think in 2019, we may have traveled or I students and gallery staff traveled 25,000 miles to tell the story about our collection. You know, and that's something that we have to continue to do. Why is that important? Well, and I, and I think it was Secretary Bunch that said it, that said it helps us understand who we've been, who we are becoming, and who we aspire to be. You know, uh, this, was the, this was the admonition of Frederick Douglass, right? Advocate, advocate, advocate. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Andrews, uh, we're going to go to you. And then um, uh, John T. Robinson, uh, we're going to give you the last word as the voice of, of, of experience. What needs to change in this field? Um, the, the field is, um, is paying attention, but uh, perhaps is inadequately uh, meeting the moment um, with, with attempts that that if not sustained, will end up just being mere box checking. Uh, what needs to change in this, in this museum field and the art field in general? Voices in the room. 
the people who make decisions, you know, the, the ways that we see when you keep hiring generation after generation, the same type of people who went to the same schools have the same perspectives, there's a very specific history that continues on. And I'm very excited about the work that's happening here uh, at the AUC with the Atlanta University Center Art Collective. It's a art history and curatorial studies program. So when you say babies in the museum, I thought you were talking about college students because we have emerging baby curators here who are doing incredible work. And it really heartens me to see that young people, you know, 18 to 22 are getting access to um, things that you would never imagine a young Black person who didn't, uh, you know, who wasn't born into wealth who wasn't born into a, an art family would, would be able to. And so I think that there are some really exciting things on the horizon and that, frankly, the field should be looking toward HBCUs for the ways that we navigate, the ways that we have these multiple points of entry, engaging with faculty, engaging with students, engaging with public audiences, because I think we've been doing it right all along. And, and that um, these big encyclopedic museums, these other art spaces that can be very elitist, um, you know, really have many things to learn. Dr. Robinson, what needs to change uh, will will uh, end with you as the voice of not only experience, but as a tireless advocate in the field. What needs to change? I saw the Super Bowl on Sunday. I don't know if you all looked at the Super Bowl, but I did. And I was especially um, inspired by the halftime, the halftime show. So I'm going to tell you what I think that we should do um, individually and collectively as a group. We should make some noise. Just keep making noise. Those are my last words. Keep making noise. What a great, great admonition for us all. Let's keep making noise. And thank you for making noise with us. Dr. Liz Andrew, director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Arts. Dr. John T. Robinson, curator of the Legacy Museum at Tuskegee University and founding director of the Alliance of HBCU Museums and Galleries. And Jamal Sheets, director and curator of the Fisk University Art Gallery. Please, please, please keep uh, helping us to navigate improvements to our own museums and to this field. Uh, it's, it's so very important and you are such a, um, a example to us all. Uh, please thank your staffs, thank the students, thank your volunteers, thank your funders and thank your communities. Everyone stay safe and thanks so much for, for attending all attendees. Really appreciate it. We'll see you on Tuesday. Take care.